praise the Lord class and <laughs> CSTI students, welcome back to Book of Acts, second Book of Acts that is, starting at chapter 13 basically, though we're doing an overview and we're continuing here in our second lesson in the overview that we started last time together. Thank you for being with us again. God bless you. And uh, we noticed last time how that uh, we walked into some of the review. Let's continue on with that as we, you know, have such short sessions here. But uh, we're going to another website and taking a look at how we have the, the outline from uh, the website of the Bible Way Online. And this particular review starts with the early church spread, the outline of the early church spread in Acts chapter 1 and uh, going through Acts chapter 7 verse 60 with Jesus ascending to heaven, then Matthias is chosen to replace Judas the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles on Pentecost, day of Pentecost, the church is born. Peter preaches that Jesus was crucified. God raised him to make him both Lord and Christ. And then the church began uh, after Peter preached, Acts 2.38. And uh, then in 3 and 1, persecution began. Persecution continued through 4.31. And uh, the believers shared generously with each other in chapter 4. And then in chapter 5, we have Ananias and Sapphira uh, that are lying and being slain. And then comes another wave of persecution. And then is the provision made for the neglected Grecian widows, chapter 6, actually with the rising of leadership and uh, the appointment of deacons. And then Stephen is arrested in the ending of chapter 6, and he preaches there in chapter 7, and he's stoned at the end of chapter 7. And then the gospel spreads to Samaria in Acts chapter 8 with increased persecution and Philip going on the way to Samaria. Uh, then Simon the sorcerer is being converted and then Philip leaves Samaria. It's an interesting that he leaves an incredible revival of Samaria and uh, meets up with a single individual, the Ethiopian eunuch, and uh, baptizes him and then... Uh, we have the account in chapter 9 of Saul's conversion as the gospel has spread to Samaria, the church has spread to Samaria. And uh, of course, we're watching the fulfillment of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, how that uh, it began in Jerusalem, Judea, and went to Samaria, and now to the uttermost parts of the earth, as we recognize that it is a cultural expansion, uh, starting with the Jews, going to the Samaritans, which are half Jews, and then going to the Gentiles, as well as a geographic expansion from Jerusalem to Judea, and then the territory region of Samaria, and then to the rest of the globe. And so, in terms of the Gentiles receiving the message, uh, it's uh, also the church growing geographically into Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch with Peter raising Dorcas from the dead in Acts 9. God uses Peter to take the gospel to the Gentile Cornelius, Acts 10, opening the door for the Gentiles. And then uh, Peter explains his action to the Jewish Christians in Judea in Acts chapter 11, sometimes called the First Jerusalem Council, though there's probably not exactly a council meeting. But we're dealing with what's called the Gentile Mission and uh, for the Gentiles to receive the gospel. And then the Gentile church starts in Antioch, chapter number 11. Antioch be becomes a, a headquarters, a missionary outpost of great significance in the early church. And then Peter is imprisoned by Herod and released by God. And Herod dies there in chapter 12. Again, as we watch the church growing from Antioch to Galatia into the uttermost parts of the earth, Paul takes his first missionary journey. That's basically chapter number 13 and 14. And councils are held in Jerusalem to determine what to do with this Gentile mission. 
the Gentile Christians, that's Acts 15. Now the church grows on into Macedonia, that is Acts 15, the last very part of it. And Paul does the second missionary journey, that's 15 and up through 18, 22. And then the, the third missionary journey is recorded starting in chapter 18, verse 23 and going through 21, verse 16. And then uh, we have the years of Paul's imprisonment. Uh, from chapter 21, verse 17, through the end of the chapter when he's a first prisoner in Jerusalem, and then he's a prisoner in Caesarea, and then he's a pr taking the voyage to Rome, and he's appealed to Caesar, and then finally the last couple chapters of the book of Acts is dealing with Paul in Rome. So uh, looking again into this particular uh, website for its review of the book of Acts. And again, this is just overview <clears throat> that uh, we watch the growth of the early church, major themes. Well, one is the growth of the early church. We see its early days with the preaching of the gospel in Jerusalem. And then the persecuted Christians are uh, integral in the spreading of the gospel that's following Stephen stoning and the evangelizing of the regions of Judea and Samaria with uh, Philip preaching in Samaria and then going to the Ethiopian, community, uh, Ethiopian eunuch and he is converted. And Philip then preaches in the Gentile city of Caesarea as is recorded later in, in the book of Acts. And uh, then after about a decade or so, the first record of the Gentile conversion is detailed there when Peter goes to Cornelius' house. And not surprisingly, there are objections raised uh, in Acts 11 verses 1 through 3. And then however, the right of the Gentiles to hear the gospel is affirmed. That's in verses 4 through 8 of Acts 11. And uh, at about the time of Cornelius being converted, somewhere around AD 40, Jesus was crucified AD 30, thereabout. Uh, AD 40, now the gospel came to Antioch, and Antioch emerges as that key missionary outpost uh, for the new, this early church. So Jerusalem is the headquarters, but the, the missionary headquarters, missionary outpost headquarters is Antioch. So then we have another theme of the, the man Paul and uh, his influence uh, of Judaism upon him. Of course, he was a Hebrew patriot. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. And uh, then he is the great student of the Old Testament. And uh, he is also influenced by the, inf the influences of Hellenism. And uh, as he would be born there in Tarsus, the capital city of the Roman province Cilicia, and uh, Tarsus was founded as a Greek city-state, 171 B.C. by Antiochus Epiphanes. And uh, there's evidence that points to, to the fact that Jews settled in Tarsus from the founding of the city and were given rights as citizens for coming and helping found the city. And then Tarsus was a seat of learning, having a university there, and uh, it's as a center uh, for the Hellenistic world. Uh, and as a Jew in this city, Paul must have been well acquainted with the mythological gods and deities as well as the mystery religions. And so in his personal life, Paul was a, uh, known as Saul in his Hebrew name. This is not uncustomary at all. But quite customary that we have a Hebrew name, that would be Saul, and then the Latin name, that would be Paul. So Paul was married, uh, possibly, <laughs> although stated specifically in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 8, he was not married. So it's in debate, of course, that he may never have been married. However, there are many that would suggest, scholars say, that in order for him to have been received in Judaism to the level that he was, that he should have had a wife at some point in time, the Pharisee of the Pharisees. Uh, and if so, then she either died or perhaps would not go with him in the missionary journey. So we do know that through most of his labor, at least his apostleship, he is not married and even makes reference, I wish that uh, you were like I am, that is without the wife, without the burden of the wife. And so uh, most likely she's passed or he never was married. But uh, God used Paul. 
his zealous persecution of the church to spread the growth. And then actually God used that as conviction in Paul. Uh, It feels like, as he makes reference to it throughout his writings and the epistles, how that he is uh, obligated, uh, having persecuted the church, the chiefest of sinners, he's obligated to do his very best for Jesus and to bring souls to the Lord. So major themes of the book of Acts, again pointing to this reference, thebiblewayonline.com, and uh, you're welcome to go there and get all these details. I've massaged them a little bit, but anyway, major themes include the early growth of the church, the man Paul, the central personalities of Acts being Peter and Paul, and then these missionary tours that Paul goes on, with the key idea being... You are my witnesses, as would be laid out in Acts 1 and 8. Again, the three different unpackings of 1 8 Acts being number one, that it was the uh, outline for a geographic expansion from, G- from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth, geographically the church expanding, but also the church growing culturally, moving from the Jewish people of Jerusalem and Judea to the half-Jewish people, as sometimes the reference, the Samaritans that are uh, resident there in Samaria, and then to uh, the Gentiles, the uttermost parts of the earth. Or then the third application to Acts 1 and 8 being a historical uh, and a review or rewind of how God originally started in relationship with Adam and Eve and advanced that into a Gentile relationship until it narrowed to Abraham, the first Hebrew, that narrowed into uh, the relationship with Israel. Of course, Jacob being Israel then turns into the 12 tribes. It turned into the nation of Israel that split into the northern kingdoms to the north and then the southern two kingdoms in the south. And and, uh, then, of course, the kingdoms to the north go into exile first, 722 B.C., scattered to the four corners of the earth. And then the southern two most kingdom or southern two more tribes of the kingdom of Judah would be exiled into Babylon, 586 B.C., And uh, they would return and give us the remnant. However, most of the Jews stayed in Babylon. 90% did. Only 10% returned to reestablish the city of Jerusalem. So, But what we see in Acts 1 and 8 is God saying, I'm going to restore uh, relationship with the human according to this outline. And it's going to start with the Jews. And then it's going to go to the Samaritans, which would be the reestablishment of Israel. Israel's capital, the nation of Israel's capital was Samaria. And so we uh, go to the Jews and then to the Samaritans, blending uh, historically this rewind going back to the whole nation of Israel uh, that uh, then is going to uh, rewind back to Jacob, Israel, back to Abram, the first Hebrew, back to the Gentiles ultimately. Of course, that being Adam and Eve, eventually all humankind gets restored back into relationship with Almighty God. So that's Acts 1 and 8 as we see it serving as an outline for the book of Acts as a key passage. And then the key lesson, God oversees the spirit-filled witness of His believers. That God is at work in the church among the believers and there is the witness then. So uh, we do this overview, again, just kind of giving us an idea. And uh, we're going to soon move into the layers of the book of Acts. And and, uh, not necessarily this particular lesson, but we'll be working our way through 12 to 28 soon enough. Uh, In terms of overview, though, uh, now we notice we, we need to lay some foundation and we'll explain more later. Uh, concerning the second section of Acts, Acts 2, as we called it, uh, starting at chapter number 13, primarily 13 through 28, that being our focus. However, 
to lay the foundation, now we can, we can study uh, this summary overview. And so I don't know if this kind of looks like a potential matching chart. Now, right now, it's all lined up, you know. You just draw your horizontal line straight across that the focus on Jesus is Acts chapter 1 up through verse 14. Then the focus on Peter from Acts 1, 15 through 12, 24. And then the focus shifts to Paul uh, in Acts, basically Acts 13 through 28. And uh, then uh, it's not written here, but of course, uh, a summary overview could include Acts chapter 2, <laughs> Uh, the birth of the church, and then uh, as we're watching the shift towards Acts 13 through 28, we're watching the shift towards Acts 13 to 28, we notice a major shift in, in Acts 7. So Acts 7, we will discover, is a key passage in laying foundation for what's coming in Paul's ministry in Acts 13 through 28. And then uh, we see, of course, a shift also towards the Gentile church and this revival in Acts chapter 8 with the Samaritan revival. And then leading us to, of a key importance, Acts 9, the conversion of Paul, who, of course, becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. And then Acts chapter 10, when the door opens to the Gentiles through the conversion of Cornelius. Cornelius is a Gentile. He is uh, a uh, believer in Judaism because he is already being converted as a Gentile. He's participating to some degree. But anyway, uh, God opens the door to the Gentiles through the ministry of Peter to Cornelius and Cornelius then receives the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 10, as well as he and his house are baptized. Acts chapter 11, we have the first consideration of this Gentile mission. Some call it the first, Gentile, first Jerusalem council. And we are discussing the Gentile mission. And then in Acts 13 and 14, we have Paul's first missionary journey. And uh, then we come to the second Jerusalem council there in, in Acts 15. And then uh, we're going to go to Paul's second and third missionary journeys. The second journey in Acts 16 through 18. And then the third missionary journey in Acts basically 19 through 20. Again, these aren't exact to the verses, but it's giving us somewhat of perspective. And uh, then we have Paul's defense in Caesarea. In, uh, in Acts 23 through 26, his multiple defenses. And uh, then we have in Acts chapter 27 and 28, Paul having made an appeal to Caesar on his way to Rome. So the summary overview, looking at, uh, again, from the perspective of the second uh, section of Acts with the focus on chapter 13 through 28. We really can't get to chapter 13 until we look at chapter 7 and uh, chapter 9 and chapter 10 and chapter 11 that lay the foundation then to bring us into chapter 13. We won't spend a lot of time there, but we have to engage this in order to get lay the foundation. So when we consider the book of Acts... Uh, we, we did these overviews, and uh, now let's delve into uh, the perspective I'm bringing to your attention. What is Acts about? Well, uh, we're going to look at Luke's hermeneutic, <laughs> and we're going to look at the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit's hermeneutic. What is the intent? What's the reason? Why do we get Book of Acts from Luke's perspective? But then what's the intent, what's the motive, what's the Holy Ghost perspective in giving us the book of Acts? So we're going to continue with the defense for Paul and the defense for Christianity. In Paul's defense, as very likely Luke has motive and intent to help Paul have a defense... Because we do know, of course, that he's appealed to Caesar. We do know that he's under arrest. We do know that Luke is his close friend and travel companion. And uh, when we look at Acts chapter 25, 
we discover Festus speaking to Agrippa, saying, Hey, Agrippa, uh, I have nothing to write to my Lord Caesar concerning Paul. Therefore, I brought him before you, and especially you, King Agrippa, and your wife. You guys are here, and I'm entertaining you, and I'm glad you're here. But, uh, you know, it would be nice to have you, King Agrippa, because you're an expert in Judaism, and you understand way more than what I do, Festus could say. So I brought him before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may find something to write. For it seems to be unreasonable to send a prisoner to Caesar and not specify the charges against him. So there seems to be charges, but I haven't specified them. I don't even understand what to write. And so Festus invites Paul to stand before King Agrippa and to fully defend himself, which is a beautiful passage in the book of Acts. Again, we will get to it. Uh, again, we're just kind of introducing the topics here. Uh, and, uh, but uh, after Agrippa hears Paul, he then says to Festus, this man might have been set free had he not appealed to Caesar. So we have gone through several defenses for Paul. He defended himself before the Jews in Jerusalem. He defended himself before the Roman centurions in Jerusalem. He was brought to Caesarea, and he defended himself in Caesarea. Uh, he's still in Caesarea here under arrest, now being passed to Festus. And Festus doesn't know what to write about him. There's no charges, apparently, against Paul. And so now we present Paul to King Agrippa and let Agrippa uh, hear the case. Uh, Paul, at this point, has already appealed to Caesar because Festus invited Paul to go back to Jerusalem to stand before his accusers. And Paul said, no, that's not right. I'm a Roman citizen. Why do I need to go back there? I'm in the court of Caesar right now. I'm not going to Jerusalem to be tried. I am a Roman citizen to be tried as a Roman citizen. And so he, then Paul, uh, there in front of Festus, appealed saying, I appeal to Caesar. I've got the right to be heard in Caesar's court. And uh, so that sets the stage then. Uh, Festus, Felix, and Festus realizing that I need to have something to write in order to send uh, Paul to Caesar. And Agrippa hears the whole case. And now comes the mandate from Agrippa, acquittal. There's no reason to keep this man, except he's appealed to Caesar. So... Right here in, in the record, we have a statement from the King Agrippa that understands Judaism, and he declares Paul as freed, should be freed without a charge. He sh could be set free had he not appealed to Caesar. So do you get the idea of what's going on here? Do you see how that Paul or Luke is writing a document that's going to go with Paul into the court of Caesar because it doesn't feel like that uh, we've got a particular charge to write up against Paul, and Paul's going to come into Caesar's court, and Caesar's going to say, well, who is this guy? And uh, he, the answer's going to be, well, he's an insurrectionist. He causes riots wherever he goes, and, and Caesar's not going to like that. And well, then he's, he's starting a new religion, a new religion about a guy named Jesus, and Caesar's not going to like that because upshoot religions were greatly frowned upon by Rome. They were seen as opportunities for insurrectionists to kind of rally the troops and, uh, and, and create an uprising, uh, a, a rebellion inside of the Roman Empire. And so a new religion would be quickly squelched. It was frowned upon. And so uh, uh, rather what we are doing now, and we'll explain a little bit more, is we will see how that Luke is defending Paul, who is the apostle to the Gentiles of a Jewish sect, within Judaism that is not an upshoot religion. And we are uh, giving now a formal statement by Agrippa that it can be read in the court of Caesar, and Caesar, it doesn't say it here, but Caesar's invited 
to contact Agrippa and say, Agrippa, did you say this? Agrippa, explain the position of Rome in regard to this man named Paul. And so this document will be traveling with Paul. And it appears that this is a primary purpose in Luke's um, purpose, re reason for writing book of Acts. To give a defense for Paul. What's the hermeneutic? What's the understanding? What's the meaning behind? Well, we are careful to give defense for Paul. And so that's one reason why we have these speeches in the book of Acts. And we'll get again more into this, but explaining just preliminarily, we have many various speeches that are, that is not just saying that Paul stood uh, before Agrippa and uh, defended himself, or Paul stood before Festus and defended himself, or Paul stood before Felix and defended himself, or that uh, Stephen was being stoned and just, it, it doesn't give a little tiny quick blurb of the historical event, but it goes into exactly what the, what the defense is. It's Paul standing up, making his defense to the Jews on this point, making his defense before the Gentiles on that point. And so it's Paul uh, uh, pre presenting defense that, again, <laughs> is similar to Paul standing in front of Caesar because this document's going to go to Rome with Paul and it's going to be a part of Paul's defense. At least that's what Luke's going to hope. Now, of course, Festus is going to write up something. Uh, it's going to be quite inadequate. It's, it's going to come to the court, be a summary statement, and uh, hopefully Luke's record is going to be the predominant piece here that's going to bring defense for Paul. So to uh, defend Paul, we need to explain why is Paul arrested? Well, and Luke says Paul's been arrested because he was first arrested by the Jews. So it's not a matter of him breaking Roman law. It has to do with a Jewish record of his arrest. And uh, why was he arrested by the Jews? Well, uh, he, his formal arrest uh, being brought into among the Jews when we go through, this, to, through the story. Again, this is preliminary. We'll, we'll come back to this when we go through the layers of the book of Acts. But... Uh, Paul had been doing missionary work among the Gentiles. He comes back to Jerusalem. And uh, when he enters the temple in Jerusalem, the purpose is to go through a, a cleansing ritual. And uh, the Jerusalem elders wished for Paul to do this so that nobody could dispute whether or not Paul was genuinely a Jew. Many or some had accused Paul of converting from Judaism and walking away from it. And uh, in order to wash out that, that uh, accusation, Paul goes into the temple. While he's in the temple, there's accusation made against Paul because he had, he had others with him. And uh, they, they said, Paul brought in Gentiles into this temple. He's defiled the temple. Uncircumcised Gentiles have come into the temple. And so they drug Paul out. That was his charge. And uh, Luke goes into this. That's his original charge, that he was drug out into, uh, into a, a kind of a kangaroo court situation being charged of, of, bringing, of defiling the temple. And so uh, here Paul stands up to defend himself and explains himself in the Hebrew language. And uh, as he's trying to defend himself, uh, he realizes, wow, uh, this is pretty hot. And it feels like Paul already has game plan in the back of his mind that he doesn't want to give himself to being judged and tried by the Jewish court. Well, his out is, quite obviously, he's a Roman. And he has full rights to the Roman court system. And, and he's not going to just be like Stephen and, and as a Jew only uh, available to him, the Jewish courts. He's going to plan to use the Roman system, utilize his Roman citizenry, and thereby, uh, again, uh, work towards being free. 
being freed by the Roman system. And uh, so working in that direction, uh, it feels like, again, that's the plan in the back of his mind. Well, let's just get on with this program here with this Jewish court system. And let's move through it quickly. It's pretty hot right here. And so what Paul does, and again, we'll get into it, is he makes reference to the resurrection, this age-old debate between these two Jewish sects, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, where the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And we and Paul knew that it would incite a riot. He, this hot the crowd was already hot, and uh, and if we incite a riot, then immediately Rome's got to come in. So there's his out. He, Rome's going to come in and save him, which exactly is what happened. He made reference to the resurrection, and the Roman centurion that's there drags him into a place of safety. And so what we've done is we explained Paul's arrest, his Roman arrest uh, by Luke, then saying he was arrested by the Jews. And uh, why was he arrested by the Jews? Well, to explain that, we see that, uh, that uh, Luke is focusing on the jealousies that the Jews had against this new way, as it's called, the way where Paul's been preaching for ultimately the Gentiles to be received into this new Jewish sect of Christianity. So Luke is going to lay this stage that Paul uh, has now been the victim of the prejudice that the Jews have against the way, and they set Paul up uh, and charged him for defiling the temple. So Paul's first going to the Jews in the synagogues in the empire, he always did that, and then he went on to the Gentiles, and then uh, the groups were often splintering splintering and seeing and seen as the internal squabble squabble within (laughs) Judaism. (laughs) <laughs> and to explain this growing splinter sect, Luke demonstrated how the movement originated in Judaism without Gentile influence. So that's a key point. Without Gentile influence, the church uh, started by Peter preaching in Jerusalem. Of course, that's Acts chapter 2. All the way through Acts chapter 8, Peter preaching in Samaria. All the way to Acts 10, Peter preaching to Cornelius. All the way to Acts chapter 11, when we would first discuss the Gentiles, Cornelius and his household coming into with Peter being the spokesman there. That's Acts chapter 11. Now, a little prelude, when we come to Acts 15, when we have the real discussion of the Gentile mission among the leadership in Jerusalem, the church leadership, the apostles in Jerusalem, uh, at that point, we have no reference to Peter, only Simeon. Of course, Simeon is Peter, but we don't use the name Peter. Interesting, huh? Last reference to Peter is Acts chapter 12. When he's arrested, Peter is put into prison, and then Herod, for doing this to Peter, gets punished by God eaten up by worms, last reference to Peter. We go on, Acts 13, with Paul carrying the torch. And uh, when we bring the discussion of the Gentile mission in Acts 15 back to Jerusalem for, uh, for them to decide what to do with these Gentiles, we have Simeon in the reference. And uh, Peter is already, in a sense, been used to build Christianity as a splinter sect of Judaism and then be processed by Paul. And what we have done is we have built Christianity on the shoulder of Judaism. So uh, we'll get a little bit more into that. But I'm just, you know, repetition's good. So uh, when we look at Acts 25, uh, let's walk through this now. Uh, the, the, the actual situation involving Festus, uh, that since they were spending many days there, speaking about Agrippa, King Agrippa and his wife, 
uh, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. And he said, there's a man here that Felix, the previous uh, governor here, left as a prisoner. And when I went to Jerusalem, you know, I'm new on the job. I go to Jerusalem and the chief priest and the elders of the Jews brought charges against Paul and asked that he be condemned. And uh, so the Jews that brought these charges wanted him condemned. And I told him that that was not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before that uh, their accusers, uh, that they had faced their accusers and that they had opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. So when they came here, now, he, now here's Festus. When they came here, I did not delay the case. I was prudent. I listened and uh, convened the court the very next day and ordered Paul to be brought in. And now watch what Festus does. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes that I had expected. So Festus obviously expected to hear charges that could have condemned Paul. Apparently, Felix maybe had given him some insights, or maybe his previous trip to Jerusalem where the elders had said some stuff. But anyway, Festus had an opinion that there were going to be charges levied to where Paul could have been potentially charged with some crimes. However, now watch, Festus in his statement is basically going to clear Paul. Remember now, this is a document we anticipate could have been prepared for the court of Caesar so that they could read it. And we again have Caesar's court having privilege to come back to Festus and say, did you say this? And why did you say this? And so instead, they brought me some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus that Paul claimed was alive. So instead of there being formal charges, here's the deal. It's a dispute about their religion. It's really nothing to charge. In other words, Paul's innocent. Paul has no charge against him. So we watch now Luke defending Paul, explaining the splinter sect called Christianity. Paul uh, is going to demonstrate the movements originating out of Judaism without Gentile influence and Paul emerging as the primary spokesman for this new infant Jewish sect concerning this dead man named Jesus that Paul claimed to be alive. And Paul stands on the shoulders of Peter and Paul is a solid figure entrenched in the ancient Judaism catalyzing the spread of the splinter movement within Judaism that splashed out then into the Roman world. So... We watch Paul's defense by uh, Luke. And so in the defense for Paul, Luke linked Peter <laughs> to Paul with a literary handshake, an interweave, and uh, by ministry comparison. So uh, watch what, how this comes in the, in the literary, uh, literary handshake. Uh, the movement where we first introduce Saul at Stephen's stoning. And then in Acts chapter 8, Peter expands uh, the sect to Samaria. And then in Acts 9, we have the story of, of Saul's conversion to Paul, the entire chapter, and explaining where who this Saul is, this Paul is, where he comes from. In Acts 10, we go back to Peter as we're kind of shaking hands. And uh, we're doing this interweave. And in Acts chapter 10, Peter expands the sect to the Gentiles. It's Peter that does these expansions. In chapter 11, Peter defends the Gentile mission. Again, it's not Paul. In Acts chapter 12, Peter is imprisoned, and uh, Herod is punished for imprisoning Peter. And uh, then in Acts chapter 13, we put the entire focus on Paul, as we're kind of finishing this, crossing the bridge here, uh, subtly introducing Paul, moving Paul into becoming mainstream and the main character, and uh, really showing how that uh, Christianity is emerging from Judaism and Paul is standing on the shoulders of Peter. 
And so in his first missionary journey, chapter 13 and 14, to chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council, with Peter only starting the discussion and offering the Cornelius story, but, but James becomes the presiding bishop over this meeting. And again, in this passage of chapter 15, it's not a reference to Peter, but it's a reference to Simeon. And then in chapter 16, and moving forward, we have Paul's second and third missionary tours, his return to Jerusalem, there's no mention of Peter. And uh, then we have Paul's arrest, and then we have him on the ship towards Rome. And again, we're watching Peter be the foundation for the ministry of Paul. Uh, when we look at and compare, comparing their ministry in the book of Acts, look what Luke does. He shows Peter beginning with the power of God and Paul beginning with the power of God in Acts 9. In Acts 2, we have Peter preaching. In Acts 9, Paul preaching. In Acts 3, the healing of the lame man by Peter. Then Acts 14, Paul healed a man lame from birth. In Acts chapter 5, Peter's shadow is healing people. In Acts 19, Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons are healing people. In Acts 5, we have, the, uh, we have Jewish jealousy emerging because of the success, and we have identically in Acts 13, Jewish jealousy because of Paul's success. In Acts 5, we have the release from prison supernaturally of Peter, and then we similarly have Paul supernaturally released from prison. And uh, then in Acts 8, we have uh, de Peter dealing with Simon the sorcerer. And then in Acts 13, we have Jesus dealing with Bar-Jesus, who was a sorcerer. In, in Acts chapter 8, we have the imparting of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. In Acts 19, similar. Paul is imparting Holy Spirit by laying on of hands. In Acts 9, Peter raises Dorcas back to life from the dead. And uh, likewise, in Acts 20, Paul's the one that's raising Eutychus back to life from the dead. And then, uh, you know, just watching the comparison here. Uh, Peter sees a vision, directs him to the Gentiles, and and then uh, Saul, Paul sees a vision <laughs> that directs him to, the, to Europe in Acts 16. In Acts 11, uh, we have Peter defending God's grace. And in Acts 15, Paul defending God's grace. In Acts 12, uh, we have Peter again cast into prison and then freed at the very end of the record concerning Peter. Likewise, at the end of the record concerning Paul, we have him cast into prison and then freed and maintained under house arrest in Rome. So what have we done? We have put Peter as the foundation for Paul. That Peter is now uh, going to hand to Paul the baton, and Paul's going to carry the mission for the Gentiles forward as we have built a defense for Paul. A, a build a defense for Paul by Luke. Luke now having written this entire document. I know it's to Theophilus. It's to lovers of God. It may have been to a region of Theophilus or to a city named Theophilus. Or it, it may be a follow-up of uh, Peter, uh, Paul, uh, Luke's writing <laughs> for, uh, to Theophilus as a particular individual. We don't know. But we do know that Luke is a very close companion to Paul, very concerned about Paul, would be very careful to articulate if he could get to Caesar's court a defense for Paul. And since maybe he can't come in to be a witness, a physical witness, he writes an entire document prepared for the court to be able to review and to be able really then to be a defense for Paul. So that's very likely a hermeneutic. Why do we have the book of Acts? Well, it's because Paul's going to trial. He appealed to Caesar and we need to have a document there in the court. Uh, and Luke would be a man that could write this document and have it prepared for the court. And that's a great reason for Paul, uh, for Luke writing the book. But we also have a hermeneutic from the Holy Spirit. And uh, we'll get into it next time. But I want to thank you for joining me here in our second discussion concerning Book of Acts. We're going to move forward into the third discussion and see how, what's another hermeneutic? The Holy Ghost hermeneutic, the reason why we have Book of Acts, of course, is not just because Luke wanted it to be a, a document for the court, but the Holy Ghost needed it to be a gift for the church. 
and also a defense for Christianity. So we're going to get into that next time. Thank you for being with me here. God bless you as you are giving yourself to studying the Word of God, studying now with me the book of Acts. Look forward to our, uh, our third time together. And uh, again, we'll get into this, these layers and get into the chronological study in time. Hang on, I'm just kind of doing some more preview, overview. But incidentally, there is material in here that's going to be coming on the test. Just a heads up, we'll, we'll see how it comes out in the review. But anyway, God bless you. I appreciate you so much, precious people with hearts after my own heart, looking into the Word of God as the very lamp to your feet and the light to your path. God bless you.